Good morning, and thank you for joining us today uh, virtually for our, our, our virtual panel discussion on cancer care. It's the first discussion we've had as a panel on cancer care uh, in the, since the COVID crisis began, and we really appreciate your being here with us today. I'm Don Elliman, and I have the honor of being the chancellor of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and, and really more importantly, the honor of being able to work with people like uh, you see here on this panel today. Before we begin, let me thank each of you for the generosity that you've shown toward this campus during this crisis. We, uh, it's, it's really been extraordinary and, and in many ways unprecedented. We have weathered this storm together and we couldn't have done it without you. So we thank you very much for that. Um, during the crisis, a lot of things in the, in, in the country obviously took a, took a hiatus. Uh, unfortunately, cancer wasn't one of them. Uh, the disease has continued at its normal pace and, and uh, we have had to gear up and try to figure out ways in spite of the, of the issues that we were dealing with to, to deal with that at the same time. And I think we've done a remarkable job of doing that and you're gonna hear a little bit about that today. Um, we are the hub of cancer research for the Rocky Mountain region. Uh, we're the only national cancer center in 500 miles or about 500 miles. Uh, the clinical trial activity that we get and, and manage in cancer is unprecedented in, in, our, in our region. Um, before we begin, you'll note that we're not wearing our masks. I'm not wearing my mask today, my colleagues are, uh, and they'll take them off when they speak, but we are more than six feet apart, totally socially distanced or physically distanced. Uh, we are, I am very fortunate to be joined by three leaders in our, in our cancer efforts today. Um, I've asked each of them to look at how the CU Cancer Center is refining the future of that care and, and in some ways how it's doing it uh, in the face of, of the issues that we face with the COVID-19 pandemic. First, we have Kathy Bradley, PhD. Dr. Bradley is Associate Dean for Research in the Colorado School of Public Health and the Deputy Director of the CU Cancer Center. Uh, she holds the Groney Chair for Cancer Prevention, Prevent, Prevention and Control Research. Prior to joining CU, she was the founding chair of the Department of Healthcare Policy and Research and Associate Director of the Cancer Prevention and Control at, at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. Dr. Bradley is, an internationally is internationally recognized for expertise about health policy and health disparities, including cancer patients' ability to, retain, uh, to remain in the workforce after a cancer diagnosis. James De Gradori, sorry, uh, PhD. Dr. De Gradori is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics and the Deputy Director of the CU Cancer Center. He holds the Courtenay and Lucy Patton Davis Endowed Chair in Lung Cancer Research. His lab seeks to understand how age and carcinogenic conditions promote cancer evolution and to discover biological pathways in cancer development that can be exploited with therapeutics. Other studies in his lab are geared toward the development of novel therapeutic strategies to treat leukemias and non-small cell lung cancers. Richard Schulich, MD. Dr. Schulich is the Aragon Gonzalez Gusti Professor and Chair of the Department of Surgery, as well as Director of the CU Cancer Center. He is also a, a, a Professor of Immunology and Microbiology. He was recruited eight years ago from Johns Hopkins Medicine, where he was Chief of Surgical Oncology. Dr. Schulich is a recognized leader in the fields of pat pa pancreatic, hepatic, and biliary surgery, as well as other areas of cancer surgery. He has pioneered the use of genetically engineered bacteria, as well as genetic modifications of cancer cells to treat cancer. We're very, very lucky to have these three on our faculty. I'm gonna start uh, with Rich. Uh, in your role as the Cancer Center Director and as a cancer surgeon, can you please share us how share how your work has been impacted by COVID? So thank you, Chancellor Ellum and Don. Uh, we have been severely impacted by this COVID crisis. Um, I, I looked up the, the latest statistics last night uh, at the Johns Hopkins website. And so far in 2020, about 4 million Americans have been diagnosed with COVID and there have been 145,000 deaths. This year, in terms of cancer, there will be, as similar to last year, 1.8 million new cases of cancer diagnosed and 600,000 deaths. 
So both are terrible, devastating diseases that cause a lot of death. They impact uh, the ability to make a living and they cause a lot of pain and suffering. Now, I look forward to the time when uh, there will be a vaccine for COVID and COVID will be taken off the table. But I think we actually have a lot more work to do with cancer to uh, get uh, in that same situation. I am hopeful though, that one day in the not too distant future, we will actually be able to conquer a lot of the cancers that uh, Americans and Coloradans uh, suffer from. So during the peak of COVID, our activities in the cancer center actually did not drop all that much. Infusion stayed at about 98% of pre-COVID levels. And even surgeries, only cancer surgeries, only dropped to about 60% of pre-COVID levels. Now we're at 105 or 110% of pre-COVID levels because of course we're making up for all the patients that didn't come in or all the patients that delayed their care. And just to give you an example, I normally operate two days a week and I, I usually have two long cases, but yesterday, um, a week, yesterday I actually had to do two long cases in one day, and I have to continue that uh, for the next several weeks. And it's just an example of how we're working hard to catch up and take care of cancer patients. You know, for the patients themselves, uh, they've had to go through a lot of extra steps. You know, there was one point in time where no visitors were allowed in the hospital. Now we've loosened that up a little bit, uh, not too much. And, you know, and to be honest, at the very beginning of this, I was very worried about the safety of my patients, obviously, of my faculty, of myself. And, you know, I, I worried, am I going to bring COVID home to my family or my fellow faculty members going to bring COVID home to their families? But as it turns out, I don't know of anyone who's contracted COVID in the hospital. So we've done actually a great job of caring for cancer patients and all patients. I think that that statistic of nobody contracting COVID in the hospital actually holds hospital wide, not just in cancer. I, I have not heard since the beginning. I think there were a few issues when it first started uh, in the ED and, and uh, on, the, on the COVID wards. But once we figured out the, the uh, the protocols. I think we've been we've been basically 100% ever since. Which uh, it's odd to think that the safest place in the in the in the planet may be actually in a hospital. Uh, Dr. Bradley, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly put a, a spotlight on public health. Uh, I know that you and your colleagues were doing or are doing much of the modeling for uh, for the the trajectory of the disease for the state. But how has the current uh, situation impacted your work in cancer? Um, thank you for that question. Um, there are a number of ways. As you mentioned, public health has really become a spotlight issue as we start to think about the infrastructure and the people who are most affected. And in many ways, those who are most affected by COVID are also the ones at greatest risk for cancer because of risk factors around smoking, um, obesity, those things that would lead to a poor cancer outcome would also lead to a poor COVID outcome. So these disparities have grown much wider. And as you mentioned in um, the introduction, my area of research is around health economics and labor market outcomes, the ability to continue to work once being diagnosed. And what we're starting to see is that um, with COVID-19 and so much unemployment comes on insurance and then people are no longer seeking health care. So while those currently in treatment here, incredibly unfortunate that they were able to continue screening behavior stopped almost altogether because then that's no longer a necessary treatment. And so individuals went without mammograms, without colonoscopies, without the kind of screening and follow-up of symptoms that they would normally have. And you mentioned our models. Those models are also being used um, and converted over to see in absence of screening where we expect cancer diagnoses to go. We expect at least another 10,000 additional deaths from cancer as a result of not being screened and wow. having symptoms followed up. And we expect to have additional late stage diagnoses that we would not otherwise have. 
And people in rural areas of our state in particular are affected. Our team just recently received a grant to study the impact of COVID on cancer diagnosis in terms of missed cases, late stage disease, and increased mortality. You know, we've, we've obviously spent a, a lot of time in, in, in the last few years recognizing the need for research in the area of, of health inequities and health disparities, and, and your work has been critical to that, so thank you for that. Um, Dr. DeGridori, um, I'll get it right, Jim, I apologize. <laughs> um, what, you know, you, you direct an awful lot of the research enterprise in cancer. Can you talk to us about, about what happened in, in cancer research one, beginning in the middle of March? Sure, well, it definitely took a hit. I mean, there was a slowdown. So a lot of experiments that uh, people wanted to do um, had to be delayed. There, there was definitely some activity that could be maintained. You know, we, we were able to keep some mouse experiments going, for example, that otherwise would have meant sacrificing mice and needlessly because they were already in an experiment. So it wasn't like a ground to zero. Um, we also know that it, COVID related research continued on the campus. So there was reduced activity, but not zero activity. The other thing that I think took a hit on campus was a lot of research on this campus depends on access to clinical samples. So for example, as Dr. Bradley just mentioned, a lot of screening wasn't happening. And so my own group this worked with lung pre-malignancies and trying to understand how we can use, uh, for example, biopsies taken from uh, patients at the VA and try to understand risk of, of progression to cancer. Well, those biopsies were no longer available because people weren't coming in for the same screening that they were coming in for before. So we couldn't have done that research even if we wanted to. Um, well, I'm sorry, we did want to do the research, <laughs> but we couldn't have done it. But I wouldn't say that there was a lack of productivity. You know, researchers are really resilient and um, uh, innovative, and they use their time wisely. And so people took the time at home to go through large data sets, um, to write manuscripts, to, to read up on the literature, to come up with new ideas, to brainstorm with their colleagues. So I think that it's not that, it's not that we're three months behind on research, I think it's that we're in a different place because of the COVID crisis. But we, we took advantage of that opportunity of a bit of a, of a respite from the actual physical research to kind of reinvent some of our projects and, and rethink about some of the directions that we wanted to take. So I'm hoping that we can emerge from this in some ways with new directions that will allow us to better address the, the, you know, the problems that cancer presents. Yeah, that's interesting. We we were uh, we we had a very good year last year overall in our research portfolio. Our NIH funding for new awards was up sixteen percent year over year, and I, I'm I'm going to be curious to see whether the activity that you just talked about actually results in a in a, an acceleration of that trend. And I think it might. I yeah. mean, I think that uh, uh, people were productive. We we for for the audience, we actually essentially uh, shut down most of our lab activities in the middle of March, other than pre-COVID, uh, other than COVID-19 research. Uh, and we didn't really begin to let people back into the labs in any meaningful way until the middle of May. And so uh, we're now back up to 100% um, access to labs, but it, it, was a, it was an interesting period with everybody back really at the grindstone trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, and we'll have to see where that goes. One aspect of that research, uh, Rich is is obviously clinical trials, and and uh, that's a huge piece of of our portfolio and absolutely critical not only to us but also to our patients. Can you talk about how this impacted that and where that's headed? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, clinical trials are so important. That's how uh, new treatments get standardized and and promising therapies get tested out. A subset of all clinical trials are investigator-initiated trials, IITs. That is an especially important subgroup because all the groundbreaking discoveries and all the, the new therapies that have the potential to advance things into the future come typically from IITs. And IITs typically are discoveries that were 
uh, thought about and found in, say, James's lab. And then James will work with a, a clinician at the CU Anschutz campus and say, you know, I've got some really promising results in mouse models and all this. Let's team up and let's work on bringing this to the clinics. And then so the clinician and James will work together, design an investigator initiated trial and, uh, and, 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 and put it out there. And this is how around here Coloradans get access to potentially life-saving therapy years before it becomes standardized. And IITs are so important. And uh, the Cancer League of Colorado uh, led uh, by uh, Mr. Reese, um, Gary Reese, uh, has done such an incredible job in stimulating us and the community around Colorado to support IITs. And uh, for the past several years, they've come up with this matching program where they've taken uh, monies that they've uh, uh, collected uh, from donors and offer it in a matching program uh, where uh, uh, people from the community can say, hey, I'll match that, and that gets put into IITs, and this is where all the big discoveries on this campus come from. James, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think this is actually uh, um, an area that the Cancer Center plays such an important role in, because we're the facilitators of this. So, you know, Rich talked about how basic discoveries can get, you know, ushered through a process to get to the clinic, and that isn't always trivial because you know someone who's in a very basic lab maybe working with fruit flies isn't going to necessarily be rubbing shoulders with a clinician but the cancer center sets up forums um, where we bring together at this you know uh, clinicians and basic researchers and we purposely intermingle talks among them and we use it as sort of a, a mechanism to match make and we do this through grants programs to incentivize collaborations across disciplines. And I think it's something we've done very well. So we've taken basic discovery, for example, on radiation sensitizers discovered in Drosophila, which is the fruit fly. And it's now in clinical trials here on our campus. Uh, and, and, you know, we really help that happen along the way. We're trying to sort of shepherd it through the whole process. And I think it's been quite effective. You know, our, our vision for this campus is that nobody in the Rocky Mountain West is ever going to have to go any further than this campus to be able to get the finest healthcare in the world. And clearly what you, what you're talking, that process, the sort of the, the, uh, the secret sauce of, of having science with, with clinicians is, is from our point, the, the magic that, that makes that happen. Do you want to talk a little bit about that also, yes. Rich? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, our philosophy has been, and we are doing everything to reach the goal where no one in the Rocky Mountain region gets on a plane to go anywhere else because they can receive the best cancer care here compared to anywhere else in the world. You should never get on a plane, especially nowadays, unless you're <laughs> flying here for our care, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, and if you look at even some of the metrics uh, from around the country, for example, Newsweek uh, recently released a poll uh, about uh, the top hospitals in the United States and our adult hospital UCH here on campus ranked number 12 in the country and US News and World Report recently released their poll and they ranked our children's hospital number six in the country. So without a doubt we have top hospitals on this campus and associated with our uh, uh, cancer center. And we've recruited so many people, and you've been so helpful in me recruiting these people over the years. We're bringing leaders in from all over the world, all over the country, and we have the best care available right here. Speaking of recruits, uh, one of our recruits had a had a pretty big day on Monday. I, I think we, uh, if 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 I my information is correct, uh, Dr. Terry Fry's first CAR T cell CD19 trial got uh, the patient was was uh, for East on, on Monday, which is a, a big step for us in, in that. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Terry Fry uh, is a world-renowned researcher and clinician, uh, and he works in uh, an area called CAR T-cells. 
And basically these are engineered T cells that are given the mechanisms to recognize specific cancers and kill them. And this technology has been so successful in um, a few malignancies so far, but what he and his group are doing is adapting it to go after other cancers. And uh, this is groundbreaking work. And really, uh, we at the University of Colorado Cancer Center and the associated institutions on this campus have one of the strongest CAR T cell programs, period. It's exciting. It is very exciting. Um, how will this pandemic shape your work moving forward? Is there, is there anything like a silver lining to this? To this uh, experience that we're going through today. I, I use the term experience with air quotes that we're going through today. Kathy, why don't we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great medical discoveries and advancements are made during the time of crisis. Nothing focuses you like a crisis. Um, through the leadership on this campus, we have been able to continue a lot of our research and a lot of our care and to be able to do so safely. So those discoveries will continue. Um, some of the things that we have learned in delivering care through telehealth and being able to ramp that up will diminish disparities, giving access to people who could not come here otherwise and to be able to provide greater care to a larger number of people. And we'll continue to repurpose our data sets like cancer registries and things to track the progress of COVID, but we'll make important discoveries by being able to continue to do our work. And like I said, there's nothing like a time of crisis that will really focus you. And the example that Rich just provided is a good one. Telehealth is interesting. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, we, we as a campus, were do, our, our, our clinical practice plans, we're doing something like uh, 200 uh, specialty telehealth, telehealth visits a week. Uh, and uh, in, by the end of March, I think we were up to 4,000 a day. So uh, it's amazing how the world can pivot when it, when it has to. James, what about you? Yeah, I think we saw that with the basic research community too. It's sort of similar to what Kathy just mentioned. Uh, uh, a lot of labs rose to the occasion and these were labs that were cancer research labs that had never done virology, <laughs> but they, they took the expertise that they had to, for example, make some of the you know, coronavirus proteins to help with the development of a uh, antibody test that's been developed on our campus. So, and, and we saw that even with our, our shared resources. So the cancer center runs a number of core facilities that normally function where their primary goal is to facilitate cancer research. And a lot of those core facilities switched to become COVID facilities. And they basically turned their attention towards addressing this problem. And I think they're gonna make an impact. And so that was really heartening to see. I think another thing that we've learned that's another silver lining is that we can do a lot by Zoom or by other such mechanisms <laughs> and you know, that we may not need to travel as much in the future. And while there is definitely benefit to the personal connections, so I don't wanna say we're gonna see that completely go away, we can um, be quite effective with these meetings. And, and for example, a number of seminar series run by Harvard and now even our own cancer centers seminar series is gonna be broadcast to the world. And that's gonna democratize science, where before, if you were in another country that maybe didn't have the resources and where you couldn't travel to meetings, you were getting information much later than everyone else. And now that's gonna be available. You know, the latest cutting edge research is gonna be much more available throughout the world. And so I think that's something that hopefully will continue post pandemic. Rich? Yeah. So this pandemic has been and continues to be horrible and devastating and has taken a lot of lives. But I do think a couple uh, good things will emerge. One is this telehealth uh, issue. So, you know, now uh, I did zero telehealth visits before the COVID <laughs> pandemic. And then as soon as it started overnight, I was, I had some clinics that were all telehealth where all 10 or 12 of my patients would uh, connect online. Now I'm thankful to say it's more balanced uh, where I, it's about 60 or 70% in person now and the rest telehealth. But you can see um, how it would benefit a patient who I operated upon several years ago, who's doing really well. And 
they, they don't have to drive eight hours uh, from another state to come see me for 15 minutes and then drive back another eight hours. I can do everything remotely there. So there's some uh, advantages uh, to that. The other thing that I think it's taught us is the importance of hospitals and healthcare institutions. And, uh, you know, obviously without great healthcare, we'd be in deep trouble. And then lastly, funding for research has been, I think, put at the top. Without research, there is no cure for COVID. Uh, without research, we won't make progress with cancer. And I think now all the governments and all the institutions know how important funding of research is. Speaking of funding, how does philanthropy help uh, research in cancer care as opposed to funding sources like the NIH? So I'll, I'll take the first uh, uh, crack at that. So funding from the NIH is extremely important, but what it the NIH tends to fund is safer incremental projects where you make a couple of percent advances in this field and that field. And if we're only making advances by a couple of percent, you know, every year, or every couple of years, it's going to take us a long way to get to the day where there's almost no suffering or death from cancer. Philanthropy allows more um, uh, ability to fund IITs, and more high risk, high reward projects where we're taking a little bit of a chance in terms of this project might not work out, but this could be the next great cure. And that is what philanthropy allows. James, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I, th I think as often, a lot of the philanthropy that we get like from the Cancer League of Colorado or, or Golfers Against Cancer is we use for what we call seed grants. And there's a reason we call them seed grants. It's because literally <laughs> it's a seed that we hope is gonna grow into an oak tree. But just like you know, a lot of seeds, not all of them are gonna bear fruit. And so, but that's the beauty of it is that we're hoping to plant something to get it growing to the point that it can then get NIH funding to really let it blossom. Uh, and I think another thing about, you know, you know, some of this funding, as, as, as Rich just meant, mentioned, is that even for, for example, our endowed chairs, I purposely use my endowed chairs for risky new projects, because that's something that I maybe couldn't justify in a grant, but it allows me to do that, to, to plant new seeds within my own lab. And so that's really, I think, the value of philanthropy is it allows us to do things that are out of the box. Kathy, there's a question from the audience. How is the campus as a whole addressing health inequities? In a number of ways. I think we've looked across the board at what we can do in terms of our teaching. How do we re-engineer our courses to better prepare the workforce in terms of to going out into the world and addressing social determinants of health and to consider ways in which we can be better at doing that. I think looking inward and having conversations about what is it that we can change here on this campus. And then what research can we engage in to make the situations better, to think about social determinants of health, these systematic um, things that we have in place at the institutional level, not just this institution, but in our society. What kind of research is needed to ameliorate those disparities and to improve equity? And then part of that, of course, is inclusion, that we have more voices heard. So there is a campus-wide effort that is ongoing um, the School of Public Health held one of their first um, open town halls of let's talk about it and to start to find ways that we can do a better job of addressing equity. I think this is our last question and it's from the audience as well and I, I think it's a great way to end it. What potential developments in cancer excite you the most? And I'll, I'll throw that open to any one of you or all three of you. So there are a lot of things going on. Uh, that, that we're focused on. I think one of the keys, though, is prevention. If we could educate people to eat the right diet and stay away from smoking and live a, a healthy lifestyle, a third of all cancers would go away right off the bat. There's a lot of work also going on in, uh, on this campus and around the country on early detection. So if you can pick up cancers early, you can cure almost any cancer if you pick it up early enough. The problem is we come across patients that have late stage and 
they are incurable. We talked about uh, another strategy, which is, okay, if you have late stage cancer, what can we do with immunotherapy, right? Can you engineer T cells? Can you make CAR T cells that are smart enough to go in, seek the cancer and destroy it? We have tons of those activities going on on this campus right now. And then of course, as we get very successful, we have a lot of cancer survivors that need ongoing surveillance and care. And also we wanna make sure they don't get a second cancer of another kind. So there are a lot of programs going on on this campus that look at cancer survivorship and how to optimize that. James? Yeah, and so the follow up on what Rich was just talking about, I think that where cancer is really, cancer research has been heading and even cancer care is now thinking outside the tumor. It used to be, you know, we targeted the tumor and how hard could you hit the cancer? And now I think research is showing that you have to take sort of a system-wide holistic perspective. And I think that's where immunotherapy is coming in because it's leveraging the body's own immune defenses against the cancer. But even in thinking about in whether it's prevention or whether it's treatments, how do we maintain the vessel so that the cancer isn't, you know, basically a welcome guest in the home? And, and this even relates to the COVID crisis, because as Kathy mentioned earlier, the same factors that make someone susceptible to COVID are the same factors that make you susceptible to cancer. So again, we need to think about shoring up the body's defenses. And that is gonna, I think, serve multiple purposes, and not just for cancer, but in sort of disease in general. Kathy? So for me, there are two really important areas. One is this one around disparities and to eliminate disparities so that we have more equal outcomes. And that is true and we've seen in this pandemic of who is adversely affected relative to everyone else. The same is true for cancer as we look at the risk factors and the things and who has the worst cancer outcomes. It's these same groups of those who are exposed to long-term poverty, racism, and societal disadvantages. Um, so it would be the elimination of that. And I hope that some of the progress that we're making now will even the playing field better. And then the second is back to prevention. Wouldn't it be better to just simply never have this disease, <laughs> you know, so that we could really focus our energy and time on preventing rather than worrying about all the things that we have to do with the treatment and the long-term effects. And it's great that we have all of those things, but prevention would be so much better to just simply never have it. So I think there's an area of research that we can make important progress on. I think we can all agree on that. That's a, a, a great way to, to close it. I, you know, at, 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 for those of you watching today, I, uh, again, we thank you for joining us. As you heard from Dr. Shulik and De Gregori earlier, we are delighted to be partnering again with the Cancer League of Colorado to support innovative uh, research at the CU Cancer Center. And the Cancer Center of Colorado has generously pledged $150,000 to match every gift two for one to the, for the investigator initiated trial program, the IAT program that Dr. Shulik talked about earlier tripling your impact and accelerating cancer research with that sort of breakthrough tremendous potential. Uh, we hope that you'll consider joining us to help provide patients access to those new therapies and, uh, and join us in that, in that challenge. So thank you again. Uh, we will create a link to the IIT match as follow-up. Again, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this program and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. And by all means, stay safe. Thank you.